Welcome everybody to another edition of Legal Tech Week. It's September 16th, 2022. This is the show where we talk about the top stories in legal tech and innovation. Uh, I'm Bob Ambrogi. I write the blog Law Sites and have the podcast Law Next. And uh, we are very happy to have a special guest with us today, the, the new editor-in-chief of Legal Tech News, Stephanie Wilkins. Uh, Stephanie, why don't you just take a moment to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about yourself. Say hi. Hello, thank you for having me. It's nice to be called a special guest. Um, <laughs> I, yeah, I started You're special Monday. in a different way when we talk about Joe, but with you, we'll, okay. we'll... Yeah, I mean, I'm special in a lot of ways. You've just met me, it's okay. <laughs> um, yeah, I started on Monday. I, much like Joe, actually, though, we went to law school together, although I was a year behind him, so I am younger than him. I would like that noted. <laughs> um, so NYU, and then I practiced for in litigation for about eight years at first at LaBeouf. I was not at the Dewey and LaBeouf debacle stage. I left before that. Um, and then at Clyde & Co. And then I became a freelancer and I've done a lot of legal tech writing. I was doing a lot of the sponsored content in legal tech for above the law again, because my life circles back to Joe a lot. Um, and then over time, I just fell into that niche. And when Zach left, this job opened and I applied and here we are. Well, fantastic. We're we're uh, glad to see you there and glad to have you here with us today. Uh, and then uh, our a bunch of our regular panelists are here today as well. And so let's go around and introduce yourselves. Caroline, you want to kick us off? I was just saying welcome to Stephanie in the chat too. I was just joining the join, <laughs> joining the one. Uh, yes, Caroline Hill, I'm editor in chief of Legal IT Insider. I'm not going to do the long intro because you know me, but <laughs> uh, it's good to be here. Obviously, we've got lots going on at home that we couldn't think of any legal tech angle to do with the Queen, though, unfortunately. Um, so yeah, so <laughs> but uh, nice to be here. All right, and uh, 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 Nikki Black. Uh, thanks. I'm Nikki Black. I'm the legal technology evangelist with my case, um, law practice management software. Uh, I also write legal tech columns for Above the Law, ABA Journal, and the Daily Record. And the big takeaway I've had so far from the queen is uh, dying is I just keep seeing lots of videos of like soldiers collapsing, like around, I don't know, around her coffin. Like, I don't know what's happening with all these soldiers, but they're all dehydrated and collapsing. And I feel like something needs to change. So that that's my big takeaway from her dying so far. So we'll see. I feel bad. I feel, I, I feel bad she died, but I feel bad for all the soldiers falling over too. So <laughs> it's all a ridiculous kit they have to wear. Was it more than one soldier? I thought it was only one. That's bad if it's multiple. I thought it was like, it's possible that I, because I'm getting this from TikTok, it may be like videos of like yeah, other soldiers collapsing at different times. I don't know. So I really, this is a, I'm a poor source for this. I probably this shouldn't is, have mentioned it. <laughs> I mean, it, that's the kind of softness that allowed us to win in 1770. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, it's All right. Good. All right, Gene O'Grady. Hi, uh, hi, I'm Gene O'Grady. I am the uh, editor and writer of Dewey B Strategic, which covers legal knowledge, information, in, and innovation. And I also write a monthly column for Legal Tech Hub. And last but not least, Joe Patrice. Joe Patrice from Above the Law and the Thinking Like a Lawyer podcast. And uh, yeah, uh, excited to be here, uh, joined by my long, 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 long time friend, Stephanie. And uh, yeah, let's uh, talk about some tech. You don't need to make me sound that old, Joe. <laughs> oh, I did. I, I did after the, after the swipe I got earlier about you being younger. I had to do something. <laughs> Still true, but the more longs you add, the longer you get, <laughs> or older you get. <laughs> It'd be one of you stayed back in law school or something. Does anybody stay back in law school? I actually, I had a friend who stayed back in law school who graduated, ended up graduating a year after me, even though she was supposed to be in my class. But basically, they gave her another chance is what it came down to. But, oh. um, and I'm reading this chat about this book, uh, Service of the Dam. I haven't read it, but it looks like uh, looks like we all should. We should maybe we should have a little, you know, Legal Tech Week book club or something. We can we can start doing uh, chats about that. But anything anything about Stephen Brill, I I love to read. Uh, 
fascinating guy. And uh, is it about actually, Stephen or by Stephen? <laughs> it, apparently, he's in, it, it's it. Part of it is about about him and the founding of the American Lawyer. It says, "Oh my God, I got to yeah. read." It. <laughs> yeah, that that is uh, like the Jones Day part is what everyone's talking about, but the ALM stuff is is definitely in there. Awesome, uh, I I I can remember uh, being in the ALM offices and watching Steve Brill. Uh, Kind of walk around commandingly. We always had the suspenders and the tie and the the, the really sort of hip looking uh, look of the what was that the eighties? What was that? When when did, he, when did he even start America? It was the eighties. Yeah, yeah, yeah 80s, I, I yes. believe it started around nineteen eighty five. Yeah, that probably sounds. Not right. that I was there. <laughs> yeah, I didn't work there then, but I was in there a lot and uh, got to meet him a number of times. Um, all right. Well, uh, I mean. We, you know, inevitably we have to talk about Thompson Reuters this week, I guess, because just about all of us wrote stories about Thompson Reuters this week. Uh, and the big news, and maybe I put question mark after that, um, was their launch of their next, next, next new version of Westlaw. You know, there was Westlaw Next and then Westlaw Edge, and, uh, and uh, now we've got Westlaw Precision. Um, and, uh, you know, there was a sort of a, a lot of mystery and and uh, lead up to it. Um, Gene and I were Gene was just commenting on how you know we were some of us journalists were all getting sort of pumped by people who thought we might know something, and uh, of course we didn't say anything, we couldn't reveal anything, uh, but most of us really didn't know anything until Monday when they had an event for the media and laid it all out. Uh, so there's a lot of mystery around it, but uh, I don't know what what was the What's your takeaway, Gene? You're you're a this is kind of your area of specialty. What did you think of it all? Well, you know, it's what I was I was sh like you. I was shocked because I if I guess I was I was thinking that the the next product they came out with would be a direct competitor to Case Text Compose, and in some ways, I think they are targeting some aspects of Case Text Compose because it does. Uh, you allow you to search by jurisdiction and you know uh, procedural pro posture, and it also allows you to start building a, a brief. So I think it. I think that's where they were going, and I think I was shocked and disappointed in some ways. But hear me out. I don't want to be too hard on them because it's the only time I could remember them rolling out a partial product because it has lots of limitations. It has, um, uh, you know, it only goes back 12 years. It only includes published cases and it only, it's, it's slices. So they have eight slices and they're gonna have 23 or 22 by the end. And who knows how many they would actually need to have in order to have a full product. And then I remembered that when Westlaw first rolled out, now I'm really dating myself. <laughs> it was head notes only. They only had, uh, head notes and you couldn't get the and I think they were protecting their case law but and then I remembered when what well, I think they didn't get the get the understand the need for full text cases online right at that and point. When I think Lexus they thought that was it. just a right why would anybody right. want that right <laughs> and when Lexus first rolled out it was only Ohio and federal and maybe in the beginning it was only Ohio so I mean I think they have taken on a very very heavy lift and it is going to take time from from my history as someone who has to represent the people who have to sign the contracts, it's really problematic because there are going to be people out there who just signed a contract in 2022 that's a multi-year contract who are going to be, I mean, Thompson enhancements are never cheap. So I think if you, you have to assume you, you signed a long-term contract thinking you were going to get some stability and bam, all of a sudden you're going to have to pay for something more. If Thompson Reuters we're saying we're going to give this to all of our existing edge customers. I really, it, it would really change my attitude because <laughs> I'd, I'd, I'd be much more excited about it. I sort of get stuck in the, how are they going to price it? The other issue I see as somewhat problematic, and I raised this in my blog post, was they are really doubling down on it's going to save lawyers half their research time. And I, and I actually do believe that. I think for the issues it covers, that may be true. The problem- As long as what you're looking for happened recently in a specific practice area. 
Yeah. So, but <laughs> when I think of the, the, the way you sell that to law firms right now in a recession is to say your billable time for litigators may go down by 50%. That may be virtuous, but is that really something people want? The way you would have to offset that is say, this is probably going to eliminate uh, write-offs. But I don't know any law firm that actually understands their associate write-offs for legal research. So I think they've sort of created a dilemma for themselves in terms of what is the marketing message? Yeah. I mean, I thought uh, I oh. Oh, I, 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 th I just thought that it was a very interesting, uh, it took a while to get, you know, to Gene's point about it, what's the marketing message. I, I will say it took a long time for me to quite understand what they were doing. It seemed like they were telling us, hey, we let you research things. And I was like, I would hope so. Uh, but as, as it started becoming clearer what was going on, I, I do think it's clever. I think there is something to be said as somebody who used to run those searches and get 300 cases, half of which use the right words that I want, but in completely different contexts. The idea of having smart filters where you can say, no, I want this word, but in the context of a motion to dismiss where the parties are these kind of parties and whatever is a smart move. And it is going to make that kind of searching much more efficient. Uh, but yeah, I, it, it took a while for that message to be clear as, to, as that's what they were doing. Well, so, to Jean's no, no, go ahead. Go on, go on, go on. Oh, sorry. To Jean, to Jean's point um, about the you know the re reduction in time, I see it as it could be as with any of these types of conversations. I suppose could be a huge competitive advantage, right? Where you're where you're a firm being paid a, a huge premium for getting things done quicker, where that where time is uh, you know of a huge value to the client. I think the fact that they can get it done, anything, anything done. I'm speaking to so someone at one of the big white shoe firms and they're saying you know, this idea that somehow we, we get undercut by doing things quicker is rubbish because the 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 client will pay more first you know I mean I know that maybe it doesn't apply so much where you're talking about research but um I, I thought that this could potentially give quite a good competitive edge and the, the other thing I thought was interesting was the people side of it you know that they the Thompson have come out with a lot of the focus of the briefing that we got was on the people that they've invested in so it wasn't it was it was a conversation about the technology but obviously a lot of what they've been doing for the last 18 months is around hiring they've hired a lot of um editors attorney editors who have been tagging and categorizing and that's that sort of allowed the, the research to become much more granular they really invested in the people side of things which I thought was quite smart right like understanding that actually these people can start to really make sense of the case law and 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 so that these the searches that people now do um can can become so much more you know so, so much more granular and uh potentially more accurate and obviously a lot quicker but I think your points are really interesting Jean as to you know the kind of <laughs> yes yeah, a lot of the points you raise are kind of with you as well well and from the perspective uh, regarding like the partial rollout, I would just note that I think that is, especially with SaaS, you know, software as a service and cloud computing, it's, become, it's becoming increasingly more common for companies to do that, especially with something that's such a heavy lift like this, where there's a lot of people hours behind the scenes that are required in order to roll out each jurisdiction. And so uh, what's often happening now is that you'll see companies roll out with either when it comes to a new feature or a new way of approaching something rolling it out for a certain percentage of their customer base so they can see how they use it, get a sense of what the demands are going to be so that they can start rolling it out into the area, into the, um, in, in this particular case, jurisdictions, you know, that are going to be the most, hit the hit home the most, where more and more customers are going to need them. And also the particular feature, their use cases that they're going to need as well. So I think that when you have something that's as big of a lift as this, and when you have SaaS where you can instead of rolling it out every year because it's licenses and CD-ROMs, now you can constantly update things on the back end. And so I think that that also is just a little bit more of a trend that you're seeing in software development in general. And that may be a reflection of that unless uh, Thompson Reuters not being prepared or just rolling something out kind of half-assed for lack of a better way of phrasing that. But, uh, and I could be wrong, but I, I, I may be in keeping with that sort of trend you're seeing in software development. You know, Bob, you also wrote about the Walters Kluwer Future Ready Lawyer, and I think 
that actually has some statistics about the importance to clients of wanting assurance from their clients that they are being efficient and cost effective. So I think, you know, that that is always on the table. I just think from a from a, a from somebody who has to make a budget for this thing, there are all sorts of challenges. Yeah. It'd be it'd be interesting, Jean, from from the point of view, you know, the cost perspective and the fact that they're rolling it out as they go, type of thing. How that will impact? How that will? You know, how do they assess what firms pay now? Do you know what I mean? Like, um, yeah. do they pay for the whole package, or because I think Nikki's point about SaaS is a, right. is a good one, but like, how how does that impact the way that they they they're going to get people to pay for it? Yeah. What I what I was questioning about this whole approach they're taking, which was it's really interesting, but as, as Caroline, as you said, they've they've hired what is it, two hundred and fifty editors or something over the last year and a half to do this, and over the course of a year and a half, they got ten years done or twelve years done. Uh, I, I think our case law goes back a little bit farther than that. So, uh, if if their approach is to say they are going to now go through and tag and classify you know, the, the corpus of, of legal cases, and then I suppose beyond that, the statutes and other secondary material, <laughs> by what year are they gonna have this all done? And uh, will any of us be alive at that point <laughs> to care about it? I, I, mean, I mean, yeah. I mean, what do you mean? Like it goes back further than 12 years. I mean, like, but as a practical, but, but I mean, I get that. But like, as a practical matter, what I learned from the last Supreme Court term was that it doesn't matter what the precedent was. <laughs> so we can just pull the trigger. I, I, and I'm being facetious there. But I, it yeah. it is true that like, one of the features I, I'm I'm going to take the defending them here hat which one of the other features that came along with this was that more cases like this button uh and so it's set up because theoretically if you have a case from say 1985 that is super valuable it's probably getting cited in one of those cases in that's from the last 12 years like if it's seminal enough it's ending up in those sites so that button is designed so that you find your stuff that's in the last 12 years and you can click that and it should bring up the longer history stuff that its system and its human editors have coded would be connected um so I think there's a way around that, but yeah, it is, it well, is, yeah. it is weird, but I think yeah. they have a way around that. And, and I no. think, I mean, Greg Lambert makes the comment that I would think this is the creative baseline and then apply machine learning to other documents. I, I, I don't know that this is just the baseline because they did talk about the fact that they're going to be continuing to go back and continue to tag farther back and farther back. But certainly I think ultimately that is what they're doing is creating a, a, a far more, uh, sophisticated um, system of tagging and classification to drive machine learning algorithms in the future. And that ultimately this is going to, you know, create a sort of Uber uh, machine learning over what they've had before at Thomson Reuters. And that, I mean, that's got to be their longer term game plan. I mean, I'm sure they're not thinking we're going to go back to, you know, our 150 year history and just get rid of all this, all this machine learning technology. But I wonder why, I mean, another question is why they didn't just roll it out since it is a partial rollout. Why not just make it sort of an enhancement to their existing platform? I mean, why kind of make all the splash about it as something new when it's, when it, it justify is justify more partial. revenue, don't Money, you? Money, yeah. yeah. Well, but, and, oh, you, know, oh, you cynics, you cynics. Yeah, well, I also <laughs> asked Mike why he hadn't rolled it out at AALL. I said that would have been the logical time. And he said the technology wasn't ready. So they made a distinction between the content being ready. The other thing I asked him, I said, are you saying that there's absolutely no AI? Because it's not uncommon for law for products to have a combination of human and, and AI in, in their development. He said sure. it is mostly human. He said they do have a tool, they do have an AI tool that helps them locate relevant cases, but he made it sound like most of the tagging is done by the humans. It's not done by machine. Right. Right. Uh yeah. Um Stephanie, I know you're, this is like, you're just on the job, but did you have any, any thoughts on any of this or, or did, where, what, how did this all look from where, from where you sat? Yeah, I know. I mean, I spent much of my week buried in an inbox and HR forms, <laughs> but I mean, the thing that sort of jumped out to me since I didn't have as much time to perhaps go into the product is I'm always just a natural skeptic about things like it'll cut your research time in half. 
any bold claims like that always, I always take with a grain of salt as an over promise. And then we've been seeing that a bit more play out as AI evolves. So, I mean, Westlaw and TR are huge names. I mean, I would like to think if anyone can deliver on those promises, it's going to be someone like them. But I'm curious to see if that, if those claims actually bear out. Yeah. They did. A, they did. A, um, I, I mean, it wasn't a huge uh, spread, but so they tested uh, kind of the old, ver the old version against the new version on 101 attorneys. I don't know why 101. Like that sounds like a weird, funny number to me. But anyway, yeah. it was 101 attorneys <laughs> um, because that's an round number. Um, tested out the old version and the new version. And, you know, you always have to just take their stats. We didn't get a recording of it, although perhaps we should have a side by side again, like we've done in previous examples. But um, so they said that they gave stats to say that it took 4.75 hours uh, using the old version and around half of that across the board. Well, I'm, I'm maybe, you know, it took half the time using yeah, uh, yeah. The, the new system. Obviously, you always have to take that with a little bit of a pinch of salt, but I have to say the the reaction on social media from some people who have been at TR was interesting on my LinkedIn post. You know, there was quite a positive reaction from people who were saying, you know, that these, this was something that, that the type of thing that they're doing now has been, had, was talked about at TR, but was to sort of did, did not taken ahead. And people were largely really positive about it. I have to say in terms of the, the sort of the user base, it got shared, you know, um, I mean, maybe it's just optimism, but I don't know. It seems, it seems that um, there's certainly, a hope that they're, that they're not just making these figures. <laughs> no, and I, I hope that does bear out and turn out to be true. You know, as someone who spent many years of my life doing legal research, I, I would love that to be true. I just hope it, I hope it they deliver. So my, my takeaway, oh. oh, I was just gonna say my takeaway from the 101 Dow attorney um, testing there was, I, I think it is true as far as that test goes, but there's a cultural element that I don't think the test covers. So what they basically did is they had these 101 attorneys and said, go find this stuff. And they found that using the new system, people got to the same number of correct cases in half the time. And if they all went full time, they got double the amount of good cases, which great. The problem for me is, and what I think is going to be the hurdle is there's kind of a simplicity paradox here. If if I got to all the right answers in half an hour, a partner I'm working for is gonna go, how could that possibly have been all of them? You didn't wade through 200 cases to get them, they were just given to you, that means something's wrong. Uh, and there's gonna be this cultural barrier where people think, it can't be right that you just got the 11 cases you want. Uh, there must be something wrong here, there must be something you're missing. Uh, and I think, TR is probably right that they did just give us straight up the right 11 cases, but that's not going to be how people react. And then that's going to be the hurdle. And then well, I, I, mean, raise one, I just want to raise one issue. We're all assuming, and I don't know if anybody heard this, we are all assuming that the, the test was done against Westlaw Edge. We don't know that the, the, the earlier product is still on the market, West, the what used to be Westlaw Next. So was it tested against Westlaw Edge or Westlaw Next? Because Westlaw Edge actually did have a sort of AI-ish answer card. It did have some capability to get you an answer quickly. So I am, after all, you know, it, two days after we sat for the demo, I began to wonder what was the product they actually ran the test against? Or was it against uh, Ross? Yeah, to go to Joe's point, I mean, I think that that's something that is not, you know, we, we've seen that in so many other cases. Like if you think about contract review, right? I imagine that they won't just in the same way as when Kira first came on the market and they would do side by side, you know, reviews as well as using Kira because they didn't trust it or whichever software it was. You know, um, I think I, I, I wonder if that might be just the same here, you know, that they'll have to have. It probably have to. It probably have to be proven. You know, they probably have to do the traditional method. I, I don't know, but that certainly seems to be the case with other other areas where it's reduced the time significantly, and there's a fear that it might miss stuff. Yeah, and I think that that's a really good point, Joe. But I think it also calls into this whole the fact that there still exists this divide between people who are willing to trust technology and will adopt it, and the people that are still resistant to it. And those are going to be the people who want to say 
that can't be possible. There has to be more out there. So, I mean, the fact that that might still be a reaction shows that, that there's still a lot of room to go in getting people in the legal industry to really embrace these tools and trust that they can do what we, where they can potentially go. Yeah. And there are still it, partners who say, oh, well, I still think the book method is better because when you do the <laughs> online research, you miss stuff or you don't get the right process. So like there are still people clinging to their books and their word perfect. So yeah. it makes sense that there is going to be some skepticism about something like this as well. I, I literally just last night had a law firm partner at this party I was at say to me, our firm is proudly non-technological or whatever, non-innovative. And he said, I'm getting $600 an hour to do what I do. And why would I want to re why would I want to do what I do any faster when I'm getting $600 an hour? I mean, I can't believe people are still saying that. And, and, and there it was. Um, we, should keep a little table. we should keep a little table and then see how many of those are still around. Like we should track like <laughs> two years yeah. down the line. Oh, uh, this was not a, this, like, this was not an old guy. This is not an old guy. But um, I mean, this do, is a, do his clients not understand technology? Like how, how are they? Yeah. Like, right. That's going to be the issue. It's New England. They don't understand technology. But the, so I was speaking um, to the, our, our Ministry of Justice is is um, doing a roadshow. Actually, they're going over to Miami. Everyone seems to be doing stuff in Miami. Your Ministry anyway, of Justice is going to yeah, Miami. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They've got this new, they're doing a big tech initiative to sort of push um, the UK's startup tech, tech industry and startups. And they're creating a delegation to go over to Miami and meet more firms and stuff. Anyway, I was speaking to somebody today about it. And they was talking about, you know, the kind of themes. And, you know, they should be talking about, you know, AI in space and, you know, like all these kind of, and I went, and actually, I think you should be talking about culture to go to Joe's point. I went, I really think there's still so much to do, right? Like there's still so many conversations to be had around adoption and culture. And I would take out the whole, the whole management of a law firm, just completely swap it out and put new people in. Yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah. so I think that's the, where you should be talking. The, one other point in this, did anybody uh, think it was odd that they didn't offer any of us, or maybe they did offer us passwords to try it out? I mean, it, in, in past releases oh. of, of uh, Westlaw, they've always said, here's your, you know, right after this demo, we're going to give you a login so you can go in and try it yourself and, uh, uh, and play around with it. And uh, uh they did not do this this time. I'll, I'll say, in my experience, I had to recently get my Westlaw uh, access upgraded, uh, like updated. And it I seems like it's a, <laughs> well, it, it seems like it, it's a bit of a bureaucratic nightmare. Like I, they, they were very, the people I was working with were very helpful, but it took like three weeks for them to get it, all the clearances through the right people for me to just be able to look up law review articles. Uh, right. So it was, uh, yeah. it, it seems like there might be some streamlining that could happen in there. Yeah, well, I, I just a... wanted to raise that red flag, but Joe, you, I know you had uh, another topic uh, about this that look, you wanted to talk about. Look at that segue. <laughs> that was, wow. All right, so yeah, so as part of this whole, I mean, we're, we're technically still on the same topic, but a slightly different angle on it. So as part of this whole unveiling that TR did, one very interesting thing to me that they added was a new flag. Those of you who've used Westlaw, which is, most of us at some point in our lives is there's the yellow flag for some you know indirect negative treatment and then there's the red flag for severe negative treatment uh that has always been a grouping of hey this is a motion to dismiss that just got the bejesus bench slapped out of it by an appellate court and also something some long gone uh, dusty precedent, uh, and, and with again with the Supreme Court dusty precedent of like 20, ten years ago, uh, is just long gone. Uh, and those were all red. There is now a new flag, which is a white flag flag with a red stripe on it. Um, don't know if there's any trademark issues with the beer there, but that red that red stripe flag is going to deal with cases where some of the holdings are still good law, but not all of them. Now, an advantage of this is it, to my mind, I, I think from, I asked them a few questions about it after the presentation, and I think they might be slightly overselling its value, but also low key, it has a huge value. Uh, I think what's huge about it is it separates out those cases where in a direct line, it's been overturned from the cases where some later 
other uh circuit case has abrogated it, that ruling. And I think those are two very different issues that have always been grouped together under a red flag. And it matters. Uh, it matters if I'm citing something that was immediately slapped down versus something that was, you know, years later indirectly dealt with. So I think that's very valuable. Where they, where I'm not sure it's as valuable is, look, I use Roe in my article as an example. That seems to us right now to be the paradigmatic red flag case, but it theoretically would be a red stripe case because, you know, the the random procedural holdings didn't get touched, right? So that's still going to be like that. And like, it's not going to convey the, oh, wow, this has been overturned, but I'm not sure it necessarily has to. And I think they're selling it that way, whereas I, I personally would as an attorney would have felt better about knowing a distinction between a direct line over rule in the, on the same facts and some kind of later case that dealt with a holding. I agree that it would have been really useful because it, it also would just, if something is still a solid red, you can sort of move on from it as opposed to it used to be a red and you would have to take the time to dig through it to figure out, well, which part of it actually was the red, what still was. And this could at least give you a better starting point for knowing how much you had to dig through every part of a really long decision to figure that out. But if, am I missing something? I wasn't part of the briefing, so I may be missing something. But in my experience, 90% of cases have other rulings that are fine. You know, the, like sometimes mm -hmm. there's, because most cases have more than one holding or ruling in the case. Yeah. And in most cases, a lot of them are just these minor things that they're upholding that are just uh, irrelevant, but I, I would think that 90% of the cases would be a red flag based on the way so, you're doing, a red with a stripe. Uh, no, you are absolutely right. And, and that was my question to them because I was like, you, you're right. Anything where it's indirectly being changed, there's probably some minor holding that is still in there. The red flag seems as though it's really going to start becoming limited to this was a motion to, to dismiss in this captioned action. And then two years later, that got reversed and remanded. And that is a valuable distinction. Now, I will also say, though, with the red flag, you know, they're like, oh, some parts of it are still good law. I don't know, maybe it was just me, but as a practical matter, even if a decision that was largely overturned had good holdings in it, I still wasn't going to cite it. Uh, I would find another case that said the same thing because the last thing I wanted was some, you know, half paying attention clerk to pull up that case and go, it has a red flag. This must be wrong, even if the part I cited it for was good. So I, I, I also avoided it altogether. But I do still think that it's valuable to differentiate direct line and indirect. Yeah. So we, we were, we were, kind of talking last week about, you know, one approach to this issue, which is neuralness. We we're talking about ILTA and, and uh, the Pablo Arredondo presentation there. Was that just last week, a couple of weeks ago, maybe? Uh, and then Thompson Reuters is taking this approach that seems to be, you know, it's not exactly clear how much of this is, is machine learning and AI and how much uh, is the human tagging classification. Uh, and uh, and Stephanie, you folks had, a, had an article just today, I guess, on kind of uh, this, this uh, uh, tension in terms of where are we with AI right now in, in the legal tech world? Do you want to talk about that a little? Or? Yeah, and I mean, that sort of ties into my natural skepticism about, you know, this overpromising. And like, I know, like, Isha Marate wrote the article about referencing, you know, the law geeks layoffs and how it might be tied to overpromising. And I was actually at a dinner last night with a bunch of GCs following the, the Economist GC Summit. And just anecdotally, a lot of them were just expressing frustration about how they've been sold all these tools and AI was supposed to be this sort of magic bullet. And now they're finding out that it's maybe not what they thought it was gonna be. And there's just a lot of frustration. And I had one straight out say, you know, AI is meaningless unless it has machine learning. So it's, uh, it's to me kind of a combination of over promising and then also sort of a reckoning on the lawyer's part of like, maybe they didn't think about it enough and real trying to figure out what things can actually do and what it means and how it actually works for because we've come along enough we've come along in ai enough now that it shouldn't no it should no longer be seen as this magic bullet people should be thinking about it more 
isn't that a case that you know that they, they they there's a bit of like the jumping on the bandwagon and not and not really doing the leg doing the groundwork you know and, all, and maybe it's not even the tech's fault maybe the tech can do what it I mean I don't know in that particular instance but like it's I I see quite a lot within the cor corporate world you know people with CLM for example you know they would seen they everyone oh we've got to have CLM when they don't do the the work behind the scenes in terms of a working out what it is they need or how they operate or what their processes are or doing any kind of the the infrastructure and there's a there's sort of a I, I've published a piece recently from somebody saying you know you really need to think about think about it first don't just jump in and sometimes it's not the text fault it's the, the the sort of the the lack of thought behind it right like and the lack of the lack of prep and the lack of knowledge and their lack of resource and all kinds of things not really their fault as such but sometimes they're just I don't know if you got this from them Stephanie but like they kind of really under resourced they're hoping that tech will solve that but actually it doesn't I, mean, I, I definitely agree with you that it's a little bit of column A, a little bit of column B. They might not realize it. They obviously don't want to admit that it's their fault. They want to blame the tech. But I also could have been part of it is that, you know, in the last few years, everyone scrambled and didn't necessarily have the luxury of thinking about it and trying things out as much in terms of just trying to fix a hole that they had to fill when suddenly everything went remote and especially for companies that were completely unprepared and now they actually have time to think about it but no there definitely is a combination of people expecting way too much but then also for a while everyone was calling things AI even when it wasn't so it's sort of I feel like the over promising and the over expectations are coming to a head and meeting each other and it's, it'll be interesting to me to see how it all shakes out and which tools actually survive that or evolve or what comes next i think it's so i think say, the marketing oh, go ahead joe oh i was just gonna say i wrote an article several years ago uh, at this point god i don't even know how many years ago it was it was at a dc ilta a long time ago 2016 or something like that uh where because this is a good point and it is constantly evolving and i can only just express to uh new to the to this position stephanie that uh it, it used to be way worse. Uh, it used to be that AI was a hill, of, like a series of magic beans that yeah. were being sold to you so that you could, you know, get to get up the beanstalk. And it, it was bad. I mean, I was getting told by people that, oh, we will be able to map a lawyer's brain and decision making by the end of the decade. And I was like, no, no, you won't. Oh, uh, yeah. So it is better. Uh, but yes, there are very much over promising and so on going on. But I could ju ju just trust me. It, it's so it used to be so much worse. Well, no, and I do understand that because I used to write on the other side, or I would write for products or reviews of products that claim to be AI, and I'm like, this isn't even AI to begin with. Like, why are we using this term? So I definitely understand that. I guess I had just maybe naively hoped it had gotten a little bit better than it has by now. But yeah, I appreciate that it used to be far worse. Right. Isn't part of the problem just that, that more the marketing people, I hate to say it, but who are over promising or over billing this stuff? Uh, I mean, anybody who thinks that AI is magic just doesn't understand AI. Uh, and so there are probably a lot of lawyers who don't understand AI who are being fed promises by marketing people who don't understand AI. But the, I mean, the truth not, of the matter is not AI any market, does... not any marketing people on this particular call, just so they know. Go on. No. No, none of, none of the people on this call that I can recall. Uh, I'll have to go back to my notes. Um, but I, I mean, obviously, AI does deliver in a lot of ways. I mean, in this art, the article that that uh, Legal Tech News published has talks a lot about e the e-discovery context. And I mean, there's, there's just no question that technology assisted review in e-discovery has a significant impact on reducing the time it takes to review huge numbers of documents and that that does it using machine learning technology and it 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 cuts the it doesn't cut the human out of the equation but it certainly reduces the amount of review humans have to do and helps prioritize the documents and whatever that have to be reviewed and i mean they're, they're real tangible results and real savings that come out of that it's you know it's not some kind of magic thing it's it's a it, it's a interaction of of, of humans and, and technology and and producing a, a greater a greater more efficient result i think the big challenge with ai in legal is that and they always gloss over this but legal much of what we do in legal is document based, you know, the, the written language and natural language processing is challenging with the English language or any language, generally speaking, 
just because of all the nuances and how, you know, intonation or context can make a big difference in what, you know, what the actual meaning of a word is intended to be. But legalese is significantly more complex because, you know, there are all these words that have these very specific meanings, um, especially in a specific context. And so it makes it even harder for the AI to parse it and make any sense of it. And, you know, I think that's where the biggest challenge comes in. AI is really good at sifting through things and finding, you know, massive amounts of data and finding all the commonalities or finding specific words, you know, that it would take a human a really long time to parse through. But when it comes to actually understanding what that you know, language means. And then in the, uh, generally speaking, and then the legal context, it's even more difficult. So I think that's why there's sort of this lack of promise, you know, there's over promising of AI, but I think that's often the stumbling block is actually interpreting legalese in a way that is actually useful. And so I think that's why we're, it's so useful in some context and much more difficult to, um, for them to fulfill the promises that they're making in the legal space. But, but I do think all search and parallel search are coming much closer than any other product I've seen to finding clustering things that mean the same thing without having not relying on keywords, but actually somehow identifying similar context concepts without using the actual words. And I, I think that is a big step forward. Yeah, the, the, uh, the neural net stuff that Case Text is playing around with. Uh, let's see, what else do we have? Um, Nikki, you had, uh, what'd you have this week? Well, I don't think I have any good transitions to what you had this week. <laughs> well, so what really caught my eye this week, um, were these two data privacy, um, articles that I stumbled across that are sort of overlapping, but they are, um, really about different issues, but it really comes to, um, and I'll post them in the chat. Um, it sort of is this idea of women, women's bodily autonomy and um, overlapping with data privacy in two sort of very different contexts. Um, and I'm sort of using these terms kind of broadly too, but as, so essentially one of the articles was uh, that I initially read was the New York Times. Um, and it was about how a woman um, who'd been raped years ago and provided a rape kit so her DNA was collected her, um, for purposes of trying to find the um, perpetrator of the rape, but it was added to the DNA database. And she was subsequently um, uh, is being prosecuted for um, a property crime, some sort of uh, allegation of stolen goods based upon her DNA matching something at the scene, the DNA that was taken as a result of a rape. <laughs> and so um, while that's not it's it's technology because they had to parse you know uh, computers make it easier for them to parse through all this data once it's in the database and make matches so there is technology involved um but it's more this data privacy issue um meaning that eventually it gets converted to data and it's her data <laughs> that relates to her that was taken in one context and um and is being used against her in a different context and you know some of the comments, a lot of the comments of the article were like, "Well, you do the crime, you pay the time." Is that the correct expression? I always mess up expressions. But um, you know this idea that well, you committed the crime, so what do you expect? So they caught you. But the idea is that women are not going to report uh, sexual assault. Uh, it's hard enough to report it to begin with, but when you think that if you report it um, and they actually process the rape kit, which is a huge problem, and they put this data into the DNA database and it can be used against you. It's going to prevent women from wanting to um, uh, report. Uh, it's what's going to be one more impediment to reporting um, the uh, crime that was committed against them. Um, so, and but it was that that uh, caught my eye. But then the other issue um, that just sort of tied the loop on it for me was this issue that I think we may have touched on before, but, you know, in this post, uh, you know, in this world where Roe v. Wade has been overturned and you have all these jurisdictions where um, they're starting to imprison women who are pregnant because they um, have marijuana in their system. You know, this is happening in Alabama. Um, and, you know, one woman is being held in prison because she uh, didn't qualify for the drug rehab they told her to go to because um, just because she had marijuana in her system. So they're just keeping her in prison since she can't go to rehab because no rehab will take her because they say she doesn't have a drug problem. Um, but so, but what's happening is that these women are all 
uh, you're starting to see sort of women getting prosecuted because they're pregnant. But the big data privacy issue is, um, you know, sort of that um, the thought police, like <laughs> maybe they're going to be pregnant or does the data show they might be pregnant? You know, if they're going to start um, uh, collecting all this data from all these apps and from all these other sources and where there aren't really good regulations in place to protect that data. And so now there's this scramble to try to find ways to protect that data. And the article um, that I linked to just talks about the ways that it's being done both at a federal level and at a state level and everyone's scrambling to try to put in these protections in place so that um, all this data that's been collected that women have been using to try to figure out when they're going to get um, have their period, you know, track their period to try to get pregnant, fertility data can all be collected and then used against women um, if there's a belief that they might be pregnant uh, based upon that data. And so that's just another, um, there's sort of just these two issues where data is being used. And I think, although the article didn't talk about it, more easily parsed through because of artificial intelligence functionalities. Um, and it's being used against women in ways that it was never intended to be used when the women provided the data in the first place. And I think it's a really a, an increasingly problematic issue. And um, it's one that sort of to keep an eye on. And that's why I wanted to raise it. Hmm. Yeah, that, I mean, you don't want collection of data for legitimate health reasons to become a disincentive. You don't want there to be a disincentive for people, uh, you know, offering up their 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 data for legitimate health reasons, even that. So, you know, knowing that that might come back to haunt them in some other way. Yeah, that, that that just sounds really disgusting to me, honestly. The I mean, especially the the rape kit data, like how wide I I, I will read the articles actually. I just find that super interesting. How widespread is this, and what is their justification for taking that data and, and putting it into a larger database that other people can access? Like, if I went in, I would never even think that that would be collected and kept and used for anything other than my own case. But and I imagine a lot of people wouldn't. I mean, I guess I'm not surprised now that you mention it. But what is even arguably with, I mean, I'm sure they're not getting consent about that aspect of it. I mean, do you yeah, sign they, a, they, a, a privacy waiver when you go in for a rape kit? Like, that's crazy to me. Ho horrifyingly, I've been on this job uh, long enough that this story this week that we're talking about is not the first time I've heard of this happening. Uh, I There was a uh, like three years ago, there was some case, I think in like Missouri or something like that, where they had used a rape kit to try and tag some woman with some later crime off of DNA. Uh, so this is de this has happened before. Oh. Uh, all right. Um, and uh, Caroline, I, I know we had we had wanted you here a couple of weeks ago uh, to give us an update on the Queen's health. Uh, so how how's she doing now that you're finally here? Oh my God! <laughs> don't you know, don't do that. They, they I, I don't know if you've been following what's going on over there. They're like arresting people for like yeah. vaguely making jokes about it. So and actually, Joe, you made a comment in the chat. And yeah. I've been waiting yeah. for someone to come and arrest me. Thanks to you. <laughs> like, yeah. You I mean, you cannot joke about it, like because it really is, you know. But yeah, no, everything's like we've got. <laughs> We've got we've got Monday off, uh, which is great. So we can we can watch the funeral, um, which I'm sure some people will be doing. Uh, my kids are delighted that they've got school off. Um. <laughs> if I may make if I may interject right there with a fascinating like non tech story that I've heard this week. Uh, apparently, uh, a lot of banks are having fights over this legally because a lot of contracts talk about bank holidays being off. And a lot of UK people are saying, well, we want to count Monday. And a lot of banks are like, nope, that's that's an ad hoc holiday and you should pay me. And that's a fight that is currently going on in a lot of in-house departments. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's optional. So so a friend of mine who runs a recruitment business has been busily telling his staff that they are gonna have Monday off, but that he could refuse them to have Monday off. Like this because obviously they still get paid. Uh yeah, everything on TV is like there is you can't what I, today I was like at lunchtime flicked on the news and for about five minutes watched watched uh, King Charles as he's now called shaking hands up and down the line it was like very good and then I had to have a nap because it was so exhausting to watch <laughs> but that's all there is on tv at the moment but and on the news you know I've been having a lot of pen problems I've seen on on tiktok a lot of what? dropping pens. Pens keep leaking on him. He gets mad. Pens are in front of him. Oh yeah, because so. there was something on um, 
There's something someone put on LinkedIn, I forget who it was, is saying that wouldn't happen with DocuSign. Did you see that? <laughs> oh, no, I didn't well, see didn't that. Didn't you like that? <laughs> well, so someone from DocuSign decided to make the most of that and just went, well, he should have used DocuSign. Just, so there is a legal quite... tech angle to this, finally. <laughs> there yeah. was a legal tech angle, we found it. <laughs> I also <laughs> saw somebody snarkily point out that his hand looks swollen, and I was thinking, of course, he's had to he's had to shake hands with ten million people in a week, you know. Do you know what I yeah. waited for him to get the hand sanitizer out because he was literally he was very sweet, you know, he was shaking hands with everybody, like, and then I was waiting for him to get in the car. <laughs> uh in in breeding is rough uh yeah um no <laughs> you're gonna get us all taken off the no way. you're gonna get arrested <laughs> no so again be uh, again i'm not gonna get arrested because we i didn't watch my it's buddies die face it? down in the muck in 1780 whatever to... <laughs> <laughs> right i i sometimes think i wonder what george washington would think of us all of everyone in america getting uh weepy over the queen you know but i mean it's an interesting switch <laughs> so, so just one yeah. thing so i think she's like i i want i wanted to kind of tweet about this but then i think the cult <laughs> a i wasn't really that bothered but also the culture is like you literally just if you say anything that might be yeah. deemed to be facetious but i was going to put that she's actually one of the earliest versions of girl power because she's she's actually such she was such a strong I mean, okay. And then one of the things I started, my brain started going around, okay, she had tons of money and privilege. And then I thought, oh, I'm just not going to go down this rabbit hole. But she was like such a, you know, such a strong female figurehead. Like from when you think about her generation and okay, given all of the stuff, but so she didn't turn, didn't stand for any nonsense, but she was really, you know, but I'm not, a, I'm not kind of royalist or anti-royalist and don't know what I am really, but she was definitely a very positive female role model. I would, I would give her that. Um, I also heard yeah. that she she joined like she was fixing she was fixing trucks. She became a mechanic during World War Two. Yeah, she, she was a truck driver. Yeah, girls. I was really impressed with that. Yeah, she's an amazing, amazing female role model. I have to say, you know, incredible. Um, yeah. So, so from that perspective, I have so much respect. You know, I I, I sort of wrestle sometimes with the royal aspect, but I don't know. It it's brings in lots yeah, of yeah, no, no. So you should stop. Yeah, I should <laughs> stop. No, when you when you mentioned her generation, because I feel like a lot of the people, women we knew of the same age, like they, we know them from that time period. Like I saw a historic photograph of Marilyn Monroe meeting the queen when they were both 30 and they were the same age. Wow. And that just sort of blew my mind because obviously Marilyn Monroe died young and you just don't see a lot of representations of women in though in that age in power. So again, yeah. like I don't, I have really zero feelings about royalty, but that picture just, sort of jarred my perceptions in a way that I wasn't expecting as I scrolled through. Yeah. Yeah, no, well, she... to, and to that point of her, her strength, that I mean, it, it, to me, what's most amazing about it is that she became queen at the age of 25, was it? Something like that? And uh, I have a 25 year old and <laughs> uh, and uh, my, you know, he's, he's a very mature and smart kid, but, but trying to imagine him as, you know, suddenly, taking on the leadership, uh, uh, well, I guess not the leadership, but whatever you call the, what the queen does. There is a leadership, uh, it's a form of leadership, yeah, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it's it, a form of leadership. And, and she, she was, she just seemed to, you know, I wasn't following it at the time, but she just, from all, everything I've read and seen, just seemed to have just stepped into it. Well, know, and on that, authority and, and on that note, a thing that we often gloss over, when she was born, she was destined to be a cadet branch that we never cared about again because her line only gets in that position because that Nazi sympathizer decided to marry the American divorcee. Okay, your knowledge is better than mine. Well, uh, <laughs> uh, he's her, very, very useful at trivia nights. So, yeah. yeah. It, <laughs> Elizabeth's father only became king because his older brother oh, abdicated yeah. the throne. Edward with Mrs. Yeah. Simpson. Oh, yeah, yeah. So it's yeah. That. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah. I see. Yeah. 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 You know, the other thing I so, wanted to say is I usually don't worry about, I, I, I never thought I would feel at all jealous of them having royalty. I, In fact, I always thought it was silly. But thinking of a country having this... Uh, a, something in place for 70 years or whatever it was, and we have had 15 presidents or whatever in the time that she was leadership, 
And sometimes, especially today, I wish we had a more of a sense of stability and continuity. And I don't know what if that's what the queen provides, but just the sense that there's some kind of a rudder. <laughs> Our Supreme Court, that's why we have a Supreme Court. Yeah, it brings, do you know what, the, it brings, people love coming to look at Buckingham Palace, it brings, it brings in tourism, it sparks conversation, you know, and they, yeah, I mean, some of it is ridiculous, the, 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 unless you love all the pomp and ceremony, which I mean, the, there is a kind of fascination. My kids are calling me, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to have to go on mute. Oh, I was pretty sure that was like MI6, like saying we're coming in. <laughs> well, when we lost her, I was like, oh, okay, she's gone. We'll s <laughs> <laughs> we'll send out a search party. <laughs> the uh, yeah, well, uh, fortunately uh, for Caroline and her kids, we are about out of time anyway. So uh, we will. Uh, Stephanie, thanks so much for uh, joining us today. I hope it wasn't too painful. And uh, no, uh, thank it, you for having me. And you know, in maybe we can get you to come be, back another time. Yeah, you you tapped me on the week where I'm least on top of the news because I've been dealing with everything else. But I appreciate it. Yeah, well, we'll test you on. We'll get you back another week and test you. We'll test you on the news. Cool, cool. A week in <laughs> review and legal tech. We'll do a little news quiz. Yeah. Uh, not that we know it. Uh, but anyway, well, thanks to everybody, and uh, we will be back again, same time, same place, and see what happens next week in the world of legal tech. So until then, see you all next week. Bye, y'all. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye.